So today we're looking at one of the greatest souls that American soil has ever produced. Uh, James Cone called Howard Thurman, who was born in 1899 and died in 1981, um, had this long 81 and a half, almost 82 year uh, lifespan of influence on the 20th century, well into the 21st century. Now, um, a black Christian mystic who founded um, a, a memorable church, who influenced Martin Luther King, who has a legacy uh, and a written record that is uh, second to none uh, for those in America. And I think provides some exceedingly inspirational moments in his life. I, I, I put up three pictures here of Howard Thurman. You need to see who you're looking at and uh, what this is all about. Howard Thurman is a young man on the far left. Howard Thurman in the middle, gazing out a window, and then Howard Thurman in his retirement years. Um, Howard Thurman began as earnestly as that staunch starch shirt picture looks like on the left. He really was intense. Um, he was born uh, on West Palm Beach, Florida. And uh, at the age of seven, his uh, dad, uh, died and at a funeral, uh, he had a great awakening about how somebody could not know who he was nor his family. His uh, father was preached into hell by the preacher because he didn't go to church. And Howard Thur Thurman turned to his mother and said, Mama, he doesn't know daddy. <laughs> and uh, then he would grow up and um, the extent of his education was very limited and curtailed. He had to leave home, leave his mother, leave his grandmother, and go to Florida Baptist Academy where he could go to high school. He did go to high school and did graduate valedictorian. This is going to be a theme and went off to Morehouse College in Atlanta. He would graduate from there as a valedictorian and in his senior year at Morehouse, would write Mordecai Wyatt Johnson and say, my people need me, my people need me. Wyatt, uh, Mordecai Wyatt Johnson was an extraordinary individual, would become president of Howard University, uh, where eventually Howard Thurman would be as a professor. I put the picture of Howard Thurman gazing out the window because of um, a story that I heard Wallace Hartsfield tell about when he and a group of African-American pastors from Kansas City went to visit Dr. Thurman in San Francisco. They were waiting for him and Wallace Hartsfield remembers that Dr. Thurman came into the room, did not say hello to anybody, just walked over to the window and looked out at San Francisco Bay about as intently, just like that picture depicts. And he just looked for at least five, seven, eight, maybe 10 minutes, and then turned to the room and said, let us begin. <laughs> he was centered, he was focused, he knew who he was always, and he was determined. Uh, but lest you think that he was overly somber or grim, I put the picture on the right, which is a picture of him laughing and joshing with a class uh, in his retirement years when he had created a thing called the Howard Thurman educational trust. Um, by the way, back to the picture on the left, before he was able to wear a three-piece suit and stand so, or sit so stately there, when he was 15 and was trying to go to Florida Baptist Academy, he had gone to the radio, the, the train station and he bought it. He was going to buy a ticket, but he didn't have enough money for his luggage, for his trunk. So he was crying on the steps of the landing there at the train depot. And a man in overalls came over to him and said, what are you crying about, young man? And he told him. And so the man went over and paid for his luggage and paid for his entire ticket. And then Howard Thurman's trajectory and future was determined and set, and he was free to go to that school. Years later, when he writes his autobiography with head and heart, Howard Thurman dedicates the entire tome 
to the man in the train station that changed my life. So at any rate, um, you're seeing pictures of Howard Thurman, but it would be better to listen to him and also take part of um, a great film that was produced last year or two years ago by uh, Mr. Dovelmeyer. And we're gonna hear a clip of, or view a clip of that film right now. He was born the grand slaves, yet Howard Thurman would become one of the most celebrated religious figures of the 20th century. A spiritual mentor to Martin Luther King Jr. Whether we want it that way or not, we all tied together. And a moral anchor for the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. would quote Howard Thurman on many, many occasions. I think Howard Thurman, for many leaders in that movement, King included, played the role of pastor. In the 1930s, after an historic meeting with Mahatma Gandhi, Thurman becomes one of the early voices for nonviolent resistance for a people who over centuries experienced unimaginable violence. He helped to establish the philosophical framework of how to struggle. He saw himself as a spiritual activist because he was fundamentally a teacher. He had this combination of, of being kind and being strong, and I think that's a very rare combination. While Sunday morning was often considered the most segregated hour in the week, Thurman helped pioneer a church where people of different races and religions could worship together. He's suspicious of denomination and dogma and creed. He would never identify himself as a theologian because he thought theologians boxed God. And he was called a mystic because he believed religious experience was best explored within. Howard Thurman was actually practicing contemplative spirituality before we actually started calling it contemplative spirituality. At his heart, he was a, a nature mystic. Thurman is talking to trees. Trees. <laughs> Yet this mystic was also an outspoken critic of Christianity for its part in the nation's deep racial divides. And he countered with a shocking new work that offered a revolutionary new way of understanding the life of Jesus Christ and how it speaks directly to the oppressed and disinherited. I carry the book with me, Jesus and the Disinherited, every day. And he gives an Africanity to the interpretation of Jesus. He provided a, a spiritual perspective that was empowering. There were people encountering Thurman's work and being shaken at their core. I would have to find out what was the word that the religion of Jesus had to say to the man with his back against the wall. Major funding for this program was provided by Lilly Endowment. You will find true success and happiness if you have only one goal. There really is only one, and that is this, to fulfill the highest, most truthful expression of yourself. Theologian Howard Thurman said it best. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive, and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. The 1960s and the civil rights movement is exploding across America. A century after a civil war was fought to end slavery, deeply rooted segregation and blatant racism are still legal in many parts of the nation. Now they're being met head on. Be educated, but I am somebody. Jesse Jackson, Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, Otis Moss Jr., Vernon Jordan, and other civil rights leaders are convinced the moment for resistance has come. And no matter how they are treated, they are committed to nonviolence. The spirit in man is not easily vanquished. It is fragile and tough. 
You may fail again and again, and yet something will not let you give up. Something keeps you from accepting no as a final answer. It is this quality that makes for survival of values when the circumstances of one's life are most against decency, goodness, and right. They were given the power and the authority to respond to the realities of injustice in ways that could be true to their faith and in ways that um, did not require them to compromise the integrity of who they were. Many feel it is Howard Thurman, through his insights and early commitment to nonviolence, who evokes a spirit felt across the entire movement. Whether we want it that way or not, we all tied together. Every Negro in America is a little white, and every white man in America is a little Negro. The Negro needs the white man to save him from his fear, and the white man needs the Negro to save him from his guilt. We need each other. People sometimes seem to think that nonviolence was very endemic to the African-American community as a way of life, when in fact it was not. And even Thurman is very clear that nonviolence was a kind of a cultivated experience for most rank and file people, including leadership. I would agree that Howard Thurman was a saint of the movement. He gave us the basis for the march, that we know why we march, the principles upon which we march, how we march, and what we do after the march. He helped to establish the philosophical framework for our, of how to struggle. You cannot let the oppressor break your spirit, then make it break your bones or your arms, but not your spirit. That's the stuff of, of Howard Thurman. Dr. King was not completely committed to nonviolence. When I say not committed, he saw it first as a tactic until he was fully converted to it as a lifestyle. And, and my father helped me with that to, to understand that early on, people saw things as a tactic. This is the best way. Dr. King then moves to this is a lifestyle. And that is a direct connection to Thurman's conversion. And here is a nonviolent revolutionary. One of the foundational works for the movement is a book by Thurman, Jesus and the Disinherited. I have been told that Dr. King carried Jesus and the Disinherited with him most of the time when he traveled. It's a book that really describes what it means to be involved in such a struggle as a spiritual matter, as a matter of faith, and not just the effort to change laws for the gaining of civil rights. He says that the African Americans didn't have any rights, just like Jesus, but they could choose to ground themselves in their own inherent dignity and worth. And if one were to choose this, it would have a lot to do with how they would deal with the question of what do you do when your back is against the wall. I hope that you can catch a little bit of the spirit. Um, did you hear the calm within Howard Thurman's voice, the centeredness of it? How, um, to use a fancy word, but I don't know any other word, he's imperturbable. You know, he, he can't be upset in a public venue because he's plumbed the depths of his soul, his heart, his people's history, also the, the history of our country, and also the depths of the New Testament and Jesus's essence so that he knows who he is, he knows what he's about, and he knows what he needs to do. Well, let me continue a little bit more on uh, in um, the vein of uh, giving you a little bit of the biographical sketch. He will create a legacy that will be powerful and indelible and is being expressed now in 2020, 2021, and into the future in ways that I had not anticipated um, when I began this project on him. Um, after Morehouse, he will go on to Rochester Theological School, 
up in New York, and he will graduate as he did from Morehouse as valedictorian. He will have a pastorate, and then he will run into a theologian named Rufus Jones, who is a Quaker mystic and a genius. He will see something at some kind of district meeting. He sits down on the steps of the church and begins to read Rufus Jones' work, and he's overwhelmed. He says, if this man is still alive, I must go study with him. He resigns his pastorate, goes to study with him at Haverford College, and will study for him for a year before then he's called to Howard University as professor of religious life and dean of the chapel there called Rankin Chapel. Uh, in 1935 and 36, he will uh, make a trip to India as part of the Christian student movement and uh, be a representative along with his wife and two other African-Americans for a trip that will include about 200 presentations. The, in the latter part of the trip, he will get to meet with uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma, by the way, means great soul. Gandhi's name was really Mohandas Gandhi. He will meet with him and Gandhi will ask him and his wife if they might sing, Were You There? Because Gandhi thought that uh, that song summed up the struggles of poor people uh, everywhere around the world, and um, that ex experience of uh, uh, the encounter with Mysterium Tremendum. Sometimes it causes my uh, soul to tremble, causes me to tremble. At the end of that trip in India, he will go over to Afghanistan to Khyber Pass, and at Khyber Pass, he beholds people usually with commerce, some politics, but mostly business people going in and out in this uh, great nexus of interchange. And he determines then that he will go back to America and one day put Christianity to the test to see if it can all really become an inclusive faith that doesn't pay attention to skin color and race and ethnicity. So he goes back to the United States and later on in 1944, when he's assisting a fledgling congregation in San Francisco to come alive and get a pastor, he volunteers himself. The church is the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples in San Francisco on Larkin Street is where they finally light. A church that has probably no more than about 200 people in attendance in its entire tenure with Thurman, and uh, where he will have a national impact as they create the first interracial congregation in the history of the United States. By the way, I uh, have uh, the privilege and the honor of being uh, ordained at All Peoples in Los Angeles, a disciples congregation that was founded as a community center in 44, but as a congregation in 46 the second interracially founded congregation in the history of the United States. Howard Thurman will be pastor there until 1953 and then become the dean of the Marsh Chapel at Boston University, the first black dean of any divinity school in America. Now, I think that this probably has some kind of cognitive dissonance for us. That doesn't seem like a big deal to us. But you have to remember, that's 1953. That's nearly 70 years ago, and such things just did not prevail. They did not even obtain. Uh, they weren't ever created. He was the very first. He will be there for 12 years until 1965, and then he will retire and create the Howard Thurman Educational Trust. All along, he's writing books, giving presentations becoming a counselor to the civil rights movement, as you heard in the film. He will visit Dr. King when Dr. King is stabbed in, within an inch of his life uh, in Harlem at a book signing. He will go and go visit him uh, in his hospital room and say that you must uh, maintain your strength, you must preserve your health. Uh, he will talk to him and Dr. King will take Howard Thurman's book, Jesus and the Disinherited, with him everywhere he goes throughout his civil rights activities. The main thesis of that book, which is one of the two, I think, 
most um, uh, important books in, in um, Thurman's canon is this. The thesis is this. Any religion that has nothing to say to the man whose back is against the wall, these are dated times, a little um, gender uh, non-inclusive language there, but he says, any, any religion that doesn't have anything to say to the man with his back against the wall is not a religion worth having. Um, he will go on to write many more books, his uh, probably two dozen total original uh, works, and he will become a uh, leading light in terms of spirituality, the depths of trying to find common ground, listening to the sound of the genuine. James Cone says that he was the most original thinker in the history of American theology. Everyone has recognized that Dr. Thurman influenced the introduction of nonviolence after his trip to see Gandhi uh, on Dr. King and everybody else, as you saw in the film clip. He would also insist on justice being an elemental foundational principle in any Christianity worthy of the name. And he also, uh, through his mystical connections and his mystical inclinations, um, make it more legitimate, shall we say, um, more uh, acceptable, uh, more usable for people to have uh, different experiences than the main, not so orthodox, uh, something that would be kind of outside the margins and provide for alternative spirituality channels uh, in mainstream American uh, religiosity. Uh, Howard Thurman was not a, as we call it in the preaching craft, a whooping preacher. He was not loud. He was not vociferous in his delivery. But you can listen to his sermons again and again and again, and you just kind of go deep, go deep. I'd like to read something right now that is one of the most Oh, profound uh, insights that he had about the mystical connection with God. There is in every one of us an inward sea. In that sea, there is an island, and on that island, there is a temple. In that temple, there is an altar, and on that altar burns a flame. Each one of us, whether we bow our knee at an altar external to ourselves or not, is committed to the journey that will lead him to the exploration of an inward sea, to locate an inward island, to find the temple, and to meet at the altar in that temple, the God of our lives. Before that altar, impurities of life are burned away. Before that altar, all the deepest intent of your spirit stands naked and revealed. Before that altar, you hear the voice of God giving lift to your spirit forgiveness for your sins, renewal for your commitment. As you leave that altar within your temple, on your island, in your inward sea, all the world becomes different. And you know that whatever awaits you, nothing that life can do will destroy you. I want to point to this uh, extraordinary rush of books that have come out just in the last two years. Um, the the how, prophet, prophetic healing by Bruce Epperly, uh, Kipton Jensen's work that was the 2019 work. Uh, Paul Harvey and Gregory Ellison, who you saw in the film, all the all of these were done in the last two years. They're just a flood of these new books. If you wanted a book that has representative scholars. And I'm uh, who really know who Howard Thurman is all about. I would point you to the book on the far right, anchored in the current, discovering Howard Thurman as educator, activist, guide, and prophet. Uh, Gregory Ellison is a brilliant professor over at Candler School of Theology at Emory University, and this book has people like Parker Palmer, Barbara Brown Taylor, and then the two top scholars of Thurman. Luther Smith and Walter Fluker, um, and it is exceedingly fine book. And Gregory Ellison has a, a great introductory chapter that tells of uh, his own personal encounter with Dr. Thurman's spirit and his legacy.
Could we have the next slide, Brent? These are two of the newest books. Um, this book on the left, uh, Walking with God, the sermon series of Howard Thurman, volume one. This is a very, very interesting book. Howard Thurman left enough papers that the Howard Papers Project, Howard Thurman Papers Project, produced five hardback volumes produced by the University of South Carolina, and they have everything. Correspondence between India and Thurman, uh, the Indian representatives of Gandhi, all the correspondence he had with Dr. King and other leaders in the civil rights movement, uh, plus all of his original texts. The one thing that they excluded from those five volumes, those five thick hardback volumes, were all of his sermons or most of the sermons that he preached at the church in San Francisco and also at Boston University. Um, they have now begun to release all of these sermons in paperback volumes, and there will be five of them, the first of which was just produced this past November, and that's the book that you see on the left. An associate editor of the Howard Papers Project, Peter Eisenstadt, has produced this biography of Thurman, and it is one of the first that is very thorough. I believe it's over 400 pages, and he, as an associate editor of that pro uh, Papers Project, had a front row seat of all of these first source materials, and he has um, written using one of Dr. Thurman's favorite phrases, the hounds of hell, uh, that is described in Jesus and the Disinherited um, as um, the title for his biography. And that is coming out on February the 23rd. Could we go to the next slide? I want to highlight what I believe are Howard Thurman's salient, searing, and steadfastly lasting um, gifts to all of us in the year 2021. He had an overall vision that is not dimmed by time nor circumstance, but it is a kind of uh, challenge to us. He believed in a friendly world beneath a friendly sky. This comes out as a um, part of a foreword that he wrote in 1944 in his very first book, which was a focus, by the way, on the 13th chapter of Corinthians. It's a prose poem, and uh, it's beautifully, beautifully written. Um, as you'll recall, the 13th chapter of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, is called the love chapter. It's this hymn to love, and Dr. Thurman went through it phrase by phrase with uh, unflinching honesty about how that could become real. In the foreword, he says that he writes the book uh, in the midst of a world at war, but he still has dreams of a friendly world beneath a friendly sky. That's something to say, that, that, that's really something to, to declare in the midst of a world conflict. Um, his theological perspective is summed up in this phrase, the God of life is the God of religion. Another way of putting that is, something is in a religion because it's true. All right? It's not true because it's in that religion. And just stay with that phrase and, and think of what that might mean uh, in your own circumstance as a disciple, if you're a disciple, or a Methodist, or a Baptist, or a Buddhist. Uh, something is in a religion because it's true. It's not true just because it's in the religion. Thirdly, his understanding of prayer is very, very powerful. He calls it uh, a way of connecting with God's uh, divine agenda or working paper. He always wants to use that phrase, the working paper, a way to find a clue to God's purposes in the world. But then this is the most uh, fetching phrase, I think, about his description of prayer, where he says, it is the swinging door that no man can shut. We would say that no one can shut. 
It is always available to everybody. I'd like you to do an exercise right now with me. Uh, and if you would, if you don't mind, close your eyes. And I'll close mine. And if we could get off the page, uh, uh, Brent, just for a moment. I'd like you to imagine all the elements that go into faith. They might include the building at First Christian Church or Community Christian Church, where I was pastor for several years. They might mean the Vatican. No building. Imagine no buildings. Imagine somehow, nefariously maybe, that all religious texts have been banned cannot be published, cannot be read, not even clandestinely. Think of how all public gatherings could be made illegal, verboten, prohibited. Think now of what could not be taken away from the human being with regard to faith. What is the one essential that could never be robbed from us, that could never be deleted from our lives, our consciousness, our actions? And that one thing is prayer. Prayer. You can open your eyes now. Howard Thurman, by the way, that's not Thurman. That's, uh, that's Hill 101, okay? Okay. <laughs> That's what is called in philosophical terms an eidetic reduction. If you could reduce things down to their essence. Um, if you're a cook, if you want to make a roux, what do you finally end up with uh, uh, in terms of a sauce if you cook it down to its essence? And religion, finally, I want to suggest, in Howard Thurman's spirit, is finally always based on prayer. One person might ask, well, where do I start? I want to suggest that if you can ever get your hands on that first volume that he wrote, that first book, The Greatest of These, please do get it. If you don't want to buy the, or pay the high cost, the high price of the volume, please call me and I will buy it for you. Um, it, is, it would be a true gift for you to have that book. But if you can't find that book, please find Jesus and the Disinherited. You can find that and also with Head and Heart anywhere um, where books are sold. They're available on, uh, from the publishers, but also from Amazon. With Head and Heart is his autobiography, and it is beautifully written, powerfully conveyed. So Jesus and the Disinherited and with Head and Heart would be two great places for you to start. And then lastly, the, the video over on the far right, Backs Against the Wall, is a wonderful uh, about 50 some odd minute video that you would do well to have in your church library or in your community library or get it from the public library and uh, view it and enjoy it. There's another movie that is in preparation now by a woman named Arlie Prelo, P-R-E-L-O-W, and she's been working on this for at least 15 years. And it is called The Psalm of Howard Thurman. It is feature length, that it will be a feature length documentary. I suspect that it will make its debut at Sundance eventually. It is not yet out, but the minute it is, I'll let Brent know and he can let everybody else know. Where you would start would be these uh, books and or those books of sermons that are coming out now, probably one per year for the next several years. Trying to see what I, else I need to share with you. And uh, I do want to say that I've learned some new things from these new books of sermons. I understand that Dr. Uh, Thurman used to do series of sermons. We think that's a modern phenomenon, but no. Uh, he did series of sermons back in uh, the ancient of days, in the 50s and the 60s, um, and he also did sermons on human beings. He would do a sermon on Will Rogers, of all people, um, and his wisdom, and garner what he could from Will Rogers, and a host of other luminaries as well. Some persons may ask, 
when they see a picture of Howard Thurman, especially in his latter years, he seems to have three little bumps um, on his forehead. I have no idea what those are. People have said, is this the sign of a trinity? Please don't be superstitious. It's not. They probably were just cysts that he didn't need to have, or he could have had them removed, but he didn't. Um, but people frequently will see pictures of him and ask me, what are those three bumps on his forehead? What's that all about? I don't know. Um, I think um, I will stop here and uh, let's gauge, engage in a little dialogue for the rest of the time. And to use Andy Reid's phrase, when he comes to the conclusion of a press conference after a game, he'll say, time's yours. And let's engage in Q&A in questions and answers and dialogue. By the way, um, how many of you have been to Atlanta? Okay, uh, if you could make your way over to the Morehouse uh, College and you can go and visit his final resting place where he and his wife, Sue Bailey Thurman are buried right next to the Martin Luther King uh, International Chapel in a uh, thing called the Thurman Obelisk on the Morehouse campus uh, right there in Atlanta. By the way, if you can, go over to the Busy Bee for some of the best soul food in all of America, which is about a half mile from Morehouse campus. Somebody said, well, how did you get to be so infatuated with uh, Howard Thurman? How did that come to be? I was very, very blessed to come into contact with um, one of my mentors in divinity school at Vanderbilt was a man named Kelly Miller Smith. It was at his church that John Lewis, Diane Nash, C.T. Vivian, um, uh, Bernard Lafayette, James Bevel, all would gather in preparation and in training for the sit-ins at the Woolworths counters in downtown Nashville. Kelly Miller Smith was their guide along with a man named Will Campbell. You can read all about that in a book called The Children by David Halberstram. Any rate, it was there um, in Nashville that I got to sit at the feet of Kelly Miller Smith and he taught the very first class on Howard Thurman, the very first class that was introduced in any seminary in America. And I got to learn all about Howard Thurman and was just aghast that I didn't know about him before, but grateful and amazed at what I did learn from Kelly Miller Smith about Dr. Thurman. Also during my time in Nashville, the biography with head and heart came out. And I of course soaked that up, just ate that autobiography up and uh, began to be a student of Howard Thurman. Well, I, I think it's kind of amazing. Uh, I'll start with this by making some comments that I've never even heard of. I don't recall really having heard of Howard Thurman. Uh, and so, you know, I'm relieved to know there are some biographies out there of him and collections of his papers that are coming forth anyway. And uh, that someone, I, I think you're right, it's important to look behind the uh, someone like a Martin Luther King and go, how did he get to, how did he arrive at where he er arrived at and in his thinking and in his leadership. And, uh, and so this is really important for you to just what you're doing is wanna say thank you for gathering together uh, so much important information that is life changing and uh, thought changing for Christians, I mean. Thank you. You're, you're very gracious. Thank you. Let me tell you a little story about Howard Thurman and Martin Luther King at Boston. Uh, Howard Thurman knew Daddy King. He knew Martin Luther King's father uh, when he was at Morehouse, and they kind of overlapped just a year or two. Um, when Dr. King came to do his PhD at Boston in the 50s, guess who was in the World Series? The Brooklyn Dodgers. Oh. And guess who was playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers? Jackie Robinson. And guess who would be uh, in the living room at the Thurman household as they were watching on television 
Jackie Robinson make his debut in the World Series, Martin Luther King. <laughs> so if you see the real situation of these people, Martin Luther King, a PhD student, hasn't made his mark, by the way, hasn't really produced anything like he will later, was kind of preternaturally just brilliant. And he will be an extraordinary speaker, but we don't know that yet. But he's sitting, I'd like to think, on the floor along with a lot of other students watching the World Series in Howard Thurman's home in Boston. I was, I was going to ask if you could retell the story of Mr. Thurman's very early engagement with the spirit. And did, did you say it was at his father's funeral or could you recount let, that? Let me, uh, it's even before his father's funeral that the, the the kind of foundational connection with God happens for Thurman with nature first, not so much with the text of the Bible, nor Christian theology, but with an oak tree in his backyard. He would go and sit at the oak tree and contemplate the universe. His um, grandmother was illiterate, and he would read the Bible to her, so he would learn the stories of the Bible, both Hebrew Bible and the New Testament again and again, and know Jesus, and know how Jesus was always emphasizing forgiveness and love and care and the Good Samaritan parable, etc. At the age of seven, he will be at that funeral, and his, he's sitting with his mother on one side and his grandmother on the other, and because Solomon, his father, did not go to church much, if ever, the man preached. Uh, he was a kind of a, he wasn't the regular pastor. They didn't have a permanent pastor. He was not an interim, but we would probably call him an interim. He preached, that guy preached his father into hell. What does that mean? He condemned him. He said he was going to be in hell. Okay. He, he, he didn't raise him up to glory. He didn't celebrate his ascendancy to resurrection. He didn't say he was going to be next to the bosom of God, eternally embraced with God's love. No, he said he was going to be suffering the flames of hell forever because he hadn't done uh, this protocol of church attendance and the like. And Howard Thurman turned to his mother and said, he doesn't know daddy. He doesn't know daddy, but he, he brilliantly yeah. knew this man did not know what he was talking about and was preaching bad theology at the age of seven. But he knew that before the funeral. He already oh, had, yeah. he had gained some very early insight. He did. He was, he was by the way, uh, there's some folklore around Howard Thurman's birth and his seemingly precocious theological grasp of reality. He was born with a call. Do you know this phrase, in call? C-A-U-L, in call. It's part of the amniocentesis uh, sac within which a human being is formed. And part of the sac covers over the face and then uh, comes out and usually there's a very careful taking away of that film. In the, in the medieval times, it was taken away with paper so as to be preserved. Uh, and if you were a sailor, people would buy those pieces of paper as talismans and as tokens to protect them. It was viewed as a kind of a lucky charm for seafaring people. Um, one of the, the folklores is if you were born with this thing over your face, and this was true when, when Thurman was born, you were born with kind of second sight. You were given an intimate connection with God, and that call was not hiding the world from you, but giving you an intimate view of the depth of reality and the depth of intimacy with God. That's the folklore behind it. I didn't lead with that because that's a little bit 
participating in superstition, of course, uh, but you need to know that. So do you think that perhaps to Susan's point earlier that we in general don't know Dr. Thurman as well because he was more contemplative as opposed to being more outspoken and having a delivery that captured, obviously at that time, you know, television was becoming important and those sorts of things. And maybe that's why we are not as aware of him as we are of Martin Luther King and some others who had a totally different way of presenting themselves. Absolutely. A real simplistic, and I don't mean to be reductionistic in this, a very simple and some might say simplistic way of viewing this. And I don't want to denigrate Dr. King at all, but let's just say other than Dr. King, Howard Thurman was more light than heat, okay? He was not hot and a flash. He was a perduring, enduring, persistent light upon reality, upon the, the basic principles of true, lasting, healing spirituality. You could say he was contemplative, but not in a Catholic sense, more in a Quaker sense for sure. Um, you remember that story I told about him coming into the San Francisco room with all the African-American pastors and he just, he seemingly does nothing for 10 minutes, but looks out the window. How many of you have been to a Quaker meeting? A Quaker meeting, there we go. You know what I'm talking about. You wait for the spirit to prompt. Is there any preacher? No. Uh, there may be a resident or settled minister that is kind of the organizer of the community, but there's no preacher. You wait for the spirit to prompt people, and Thurman respected that waiting. He respected taking your time and going deep rather than flashing shallow and bright. He really respected going deep and being receptive. Um, calls prayer, a door into a room where another voice can speak. We often think of prayer as our practices, meaning our words. How do we put the words together? But she has a very beautiful poem that describes prayer. It's called prayer. You can kind of Google it before. By the way, Brent, um, I would want you to point people to um, a PDF that I provided for this session that you can read more. And you also, you can have seven suggestions for praying after Dr. Uh, Thurman's uh, example. There's seven of them, one for every day of the week. We don't have 30 or 31 or 28, but you do have seven in there and you could practice those until uh, we meet again. Bob, do you mind sharing the backstory of the of the Great Souls, Great Prayers, how this came to be and how you... Sure. Um, I was invited into a uh, thing called the Bethany Project by a woman named Gay Reese. In 1995, uh, at the Denver General Assembly of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, I was invited to come and partake of this and I went to the introductory, she was gonna gather a group of 12 people together. And um, I said at this introductory meeting, I said, let me get this straight. You're trying to pray in the kingdom of God, is that right? And she goes, you got it. That's exactly what we're about. And I said, you know, you got the wrong guy. I am not your boy. I'm a doer, I'm not a prayer. I don't wanna have anything to do with this. But she kept inviting me to come to these meetings. And so I went, and one of the very first ones I went to was at the Loretto Mother House in Nearinx, Kentucky. Nearinx, it, this is the, the sister institution to Gethsemane where Thomas Merton was. Uh, they're not Cistercian, they're not Benedictine, but the, the Loretto Mother House is an extraordinary place. It has the worst food of any retreat center I've ever been in my life. <laughs> Horrible. 
a bunch of really ticked off nuns are trying to put out bad food. It's bad. But it is my very favorite, my absolute favorite retreat center. When I went there, I was so spiritually, physically exhausted. I slept for 24 hours straight without getting up and even going to the bathroom. That's how, how de I know that's more information than you needed, but I was that dehydrated, that dry as a human being. It was at that, um, at that retreat also that I took a walk in a field with these snow covered furrows in the middle of January and the feel spoke to me and it said, I too need rest. I don't have a recording of the feel declaring that to me. I did write it down in my journal later and I began to rest and I began to pray and I began to be renewed. And then I brought that experience back to Community Christian Church. And then I wondered, how could I explore with the people of community the rich traditions of prayer, of contemplative prayer? Liz, you mentioned that. There's great, great resources for contemplative prayer that I was beginning to become acquainted with. How could I learn about this person and that person? I reached back in my memory to a class taught by Sally McFaig, a great feminist theologian at uh, Vanderbilt. She was the dean of the Divinity School there where we, I attended, and it was called Spiritual Autobiography. We read the Journal of John Woolman. We read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Letters and Papers from Prison. I learned, read The Long Loneliness by Dorothy Day. And I said, that's what I'll do. I'll share the stories of people of faith who've come along before us that we need to know about. And so I began to do a great soul per week for about six weeks. And then we began to do it over several years. And right now I have 52 of these, but I have a project that is mapping out five volumes of 52 great souls per volume. And one, one version is done. And if you have a publisher, I'd like to talk to them tomorrow. Um, it has people like Maya Angelou, Wendell Berry, Albert Schweitzer, Gandhi, um, Denise Levertov, another great poet. Um, oh boy. People that you don't know about, Samuel DeWitt Proctor, uh, you need to know about him. Howard Thurman, of course, Sojourner Truth, um, Simone Vey. If you want to talk about a mystic, Simone Vey, that's W-E-I-L-L. -L. Simone Vey is one of the great, great souls of the 20th century. So um, I also uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel and Martin Buber uh, and Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore, who wrote both the national anthem for Pakistan and Bangladesh and India, and also was Gandhi's counselor. <laughs> he was the first Asian to win the Nobel Prize. Nobody knows about Tagore on this side of the globe, but he's mammoth. He's a gargantuan presence in terms of literature. Anyway, he was a great soul too. Anyway, that's the, that's the backstory, Brent. Question for you, Bob. Uh, the phrase, the beloved community that you often sort of hear What's the source of that? Is that the the phrase "beloved community" is always attributed to Dr. King. It's not original with him. It's Josiah Royce, R O Y C E, and he was a great, great um, theologian and professor. For the life of me, I can't remember if he was at Rochester Theological uh, School or if he was at Boston or Harvard. But he was the one who, who originated the term of becoming the beloved community. And the beloved community being this ideal, not a utopia, not uh, something where there was perfection. We're not, this isn't like um, what the Shakers wanted to create. Um, uh, this isn't 
one of these um, utopian communities that was trying to bring heaven on earth in pure form, but it was an idealization of how true, caring, mutually compassionate community could be created. And his term for it was the beloved community. The way to really understand it is where everybody in the community would be regarded as beloved. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come together to, to learn things that we missed the first time around to continue to expand our minds and our hearts, to be open to new experiences, to new understanding of um, God, of our religion, of our faith, and of our way forward in this world in which we find ourselves. We thank you that Bob Hill was willing to share his obviously very dear project to his heart with us and to give us ideas to take it with us and to go forward with it so that we can continue to find our place in our beloved community. We ask all of these things in your name and hope to meet again. Amen.